Welcome everyone. This is Deeper Than That. I am Ansel and welcome to another episode. This particular episode is being brought to you by... And I'm leaving that spot blank because if there's any one of you looking on, listening, and you realize that there are thousands of people that are viewing this podcast, that could be your opportunity to access that network. So feel free to reach out to me afterwards and let's talk business, all right? Now, as I always say, with Deeper Than That, the intention is to have a conversation with people from different walks of life who would have had different experiences that we can learn from. It is my firm belief that decades of experience can be condensed into a one hour conversation And when you ask those deep questions, there are so many nuggets of wisdom that you can use and apply to your life. That's the reason for Deeper Than That. Now, it is my privilege today to have this gentleman that we are going to be speaking to. On the surface, he may seem like just any other guy, but he's actually an IT tech specialist for a company that is helping governments to modernize their financial systems. He is an avid hip hop fan. When I tell you, the man know his hip hop stuff. And his favorite rapper is Shylin. And whenever someone says their favorite rapper is Shylin, you know they love hip hop, right? He's a big, big endorser of reading. He actually purchases on average two books per month. Guys, listen, man. And he is currently living a dream that most people may not even think is possible at just 33 years old. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to our podcast, Andrew Olton. Andrew, how are you doing, sir? I'm great. Happy to be here. And yourself? I'm wonderful, man. I'm really excited about this um, conversation because you are at a stage that I am working towards. And before we spoke about it, before we even connected on that level, you know, it seemed far in terms of proximity to have someone that actually did it, that I could reach out and touch. And, you know, thank God that the conversation started between us and to hear that you are where I desire to be and you are willing to take the time out of your busy schedule, because I know you said you have some major projects you're working on. Um, I really, really look forward to us chatting this evening. So thank you again for taking the time out and let's get it rocking and rolling, yeah? Sure. All right, so, you know, just tell you guys um, that are watching and listening, who is Andrew Olton? Just give a brief background. Okay, well, as you mentioned before, I am 33 years old. I live in the beautiful Twin Island state of Trinidad and Tobago. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, technology is my domain. It always has been. Um, I'm a believer. I think that's the most important thing um, about me. I attend New King of Kings Life Center, which is in El Dorado with Mm -hmm. Pastor Steve Allion. So if anyone from church is listening, hello. Hey. Hey, (laughs) hope to see you soon. And yeah, I you know really really you know I, I'm just at a place in life where I am focusing on just building the future and um, just being the architect of that and and that's really where I'm I'm always the kind of person I'm, I'm the kind of person that is always looking ahead and and you know thinking about what to do next, through next you know and mm-hmm. I'm always asking myself okay is this the right move to make is this the right time. You know, that is pretty much um, the kind of person I am. You know, even when I make the three decisions, the thing I think about is, well, I have to answer for what I'm about to do. Hmm. So if I can't answer to God for what I'm about to do, why do it? Wow. And also, if I'm happy with being able to answer for what I'm about to do, 
Sure, I'll go right on ahead. All right, All right. But, yeah, but, but really, that is something that um, I think is my compass, you know? Like, right. God, will you be pleased with this choice? Or, uh -huh. God, what do you want me to do here? Right? right. So I, I think that um, awareness of the fact that, hey, one day you're going to meet God and, you know, you have to give an account. I think that is something that is topmost. Yeah. So, yeah. That, wow. Hmm. You see, guys, just off the first five minutes when we're already getting nuggets there, that is an amazing litmus test to use. I, I definitely think I'm going to implement that, you know. Every decision, I would have to answer to God for it. Would I be able to answer? You know, so, wow. Thank you for sharing that already. So, right. Andrew, there are two loves or two keen interests that you mentioned. One is your love for technology. The other is your love for hip hop. Um, where did those loves begin? Sure. Believe it or not, it started on Sesame Street. Wow. Yeah. So there was a segment in Sesame Street where they would show you like robots and these robots were playing the piano and they even had like satellites and spaceships. And of course, at that age, not understanding what I'm actually looking at, my question was, well, how does it work? Mm. Right? So as you can imagine, you know, as soon as I could, I would go into like um, encyclopedias and books and so on. Mm. And, and, th and thankfully, my aunt, who I spent a lot of time with, she had an encyclopedia. I think it was Britannica or something like that. And I'll just go through and anything with tech and moving parts, I would um, you know, want to learn about. So I was actually one of those kids that would like tear open stuff and put it back together just to see how it works. That's right. So, yeah, really, that's where the interest started. And with music, I started on, well, I wouldn't say such a machine, but kind of around that time when I would hear hip hop music and I want to create it. I remember there was one time my twin brother and I, we made a phone call and somehow we ended up in, in our own answering machine <laughs> and we realized it was recording. So I decided to beatbox and my twin brother <laughs> would actually rap. <laughs> somehow our parents heard it and, and they even played it back to us, and I'm, I'm thinking like, wow, this was kind of corny. But what I noted was, you know, just that natural leaning towards using what you have in the environment mm -hmm. to get creative, have some fun, and just express yourself, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I think, again, really curiosity, that's kind of where it started. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Listen, and I think for most children, growing up in the 80s and the 90s, they owe a lot of their knowledge to Encyclopedia Britannica and Sesame Street. Because <laughs> I, I mean, every afternoon when we come home from school, we know Sesame Street. And thank God my parents invested in that Encyclopedia Britannica and Childcraft as well. I don't know if you had that one. Mm -hmm. um, all right, but at least the Encyclopedia Britannica and you just sit down and just point it. That was Google before Google. Yes. Yeah. Uh, all right. Good stuff, man. And it's interesting. I did not know you had a twin brother. That is new really? information for me. Yeah. Wow. Surprise. So he actually did a song. Like, wow, this is years long. Over 15 years ago. Mm. in Cure Pentecostal with a neighbor of ours. What was the name? Who's name? Um, Rene Daniel, I think. Uh, actually, you were there, you heard him, and he said that, that he had a, a 50 flow. So they did um, a song on the, the instrumental for After the Music Stops. Yeah, wow. so, so, so this is like 2006 to 2007. Right. Ooh, I don't dig back in those archives, boy. Okay. Very interesting. 
Very interesting. So, Andrew, do you remember what was the song that introduced you to hip hop? Um, for me, it was Nas is like. When I first heard it, I was like, wow, somebody is talking over a beat and they have a nice flow, a nice cadence to it. I want to know more about this. Um, can you remember what that song was for you? No, I cannot. But mm. I remember the song that, that got me interested in hip hop, right? Mm. It was an, an Eminem song, and it's the one where he's like, you know, guess who's back? Back again, she is right. back, tell her friend. Like, right. That's one. I, I can't remember the name of it, but I, I, I think I actually memorized almost every single word um, for that song. Right. Yeah. So, funny enough, it, it went to that, and then I, I just went backwards for some reason. So, I ended up listening to Jesus Liquid Swords. Mm. Yeah. Not something I would recommend to anyone, mm. but I think that was the album that got me writing actually uh, and really thinking about rhyme schemes and, and rhyme patterns. Mm. And when I got Solus Christus from Shailen, that album came with a booklet. And in the booklet, he actually broke down like the rhyme schemes, like A B B A, you know, A A B A type mm. of thing. Right. So, um, and I think if I can say that there's one album that, that laid the, the foundation and was like the blueprint for what I like to listen to today, it is a little album that came out in 1999 by one of my favorite rappers to date called Christology in Layman's Tomb. Yes, sir. Speak on it. You see that album? Yes. Every track. Yes. Every, Every track, track is a banger. Even if you don't like hip hop and you are one of those folks who said, I only listen to which music, there's a song for you. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you know, just the right amount of theology for the target audience, mm. um, decent production, decent flows. And, you know, though there are a few lines in there that are a bit dated by today's standards, I think the album has held up really, really well. Yes. And, um, you know, it, it's something I would recommend to any new believer um, who might not have been exposed to this kind of thing growing up. But, yeah, that stuff is really what got me into um, hip hop and, and even CHH, you know. Yeah. So, shout out to my cousin, Nigel Grant. He really put me on to CHH. He was a DJ in the early 2000s. And he yeah. introduced me to, like, uh, cross movement and ambassador and um like goatee records and, and all right. that stuff yeah so right yeah i'm super grateful nice and since we're giving shout outs i will say shout out to michael edwards who introduced me to chh introduced me to cross movement because the rest is history from there so and and, and who was he to you uh you've passed um no a friend in church a friend in church. Um, so for me, in terms of music, um, when I heard Nas, of course, I'm growing up in church. So I can't sing what Nas sings or sing what DMX sings or sing what Jay-Z sings. So I started writing by remixing Sunday School songs. Uh, remixing old songs for Sunday School. So the first, first song I ever wrote Instead of saying Santa Claus is coming to town, I sang Jesus Christ is coming real soon. Right? And when he saw that I was getting into rap, he gave me some CDs that had all the, um, the cross movement, the human emergency, um, the Christology, all of those. Um, he gave me some tunnel rats. He gave me um, uh, Curry Red and Precise. All of those, and I just started wow. absorbing Vintage. those. And listen, listen, man. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's yeah. So he was a good good friend of mine, and um, thank God that he saw that little spark and he found that flame by giving me those those gospel rap CDs, you know. Yeah, I guess the the thing I'm seeing with both scenarios is 
just the importance of community because mm. you know the thing I always think about is what would have happened if let's say we did not get that introduction from someone within our community, right? Yes. Would we still have been listening to Nas and Wu Tang or you know, or what? Who knows? Yeah. But you know, when I look back at my, my formative years in the faith, I really have to say thank God for community because mm. you know those, those guys helped me to make certain important adjustments very quickly and early on, you know? Mm. Yeah, yeah. And I think that that um, point of community is going to come back a little bit later because I remember one of the um, one of our conversations via WhatsApp when you spoke about um, com- wealth is built in community. So I want to I wanna stick that in there because I want to talk about that when we get a little lower down into it, right? Um, now, before we came on to this podcast, you were talking about your reading and um, you said two books a month. Where did this um, appetite for reading come from? Two books a month. That's 24 in a year, sir. So that came from the COVID-19 pandemic. Mm. So, you know, while I, I do feel for everyone who has lost someone during the pandemic, I will say that um, there have been many opportunities for us to change and grow as individuals during the pandemic. Mm. And, and being under lockdown and having nowhere to go, really, I think that created the opportunity because, of course, you know, you have some extra time on your hands and you want to learn new things. And... Um, those areas for me, finance and biblical finance, which we'll get into soon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, I, and I just decided to, you know, really get into it and, and try to figure out, okay, you know, what am I supposed to do here? And I read one book, then another, and another, and I found out that there was like this whole world of stuff that I just did not know. Yeah. And so, you know, the way my brain works is like I try to figure out what is the landscape, right? I, I try to get the big picture first, and then I try to get all the little details. So it's like I just go around front trying to figure out, okay, um, what are the basic principles, what are the overall objectives, and so that curiosity is really what had me, and still has me up to this day, like going for two books a month, really. Mm. So yeah. Okay. So I know you purchase two books a month. Do you read two books a month? What, what would you say is your reading speed? Um, about that, because I started to listen to audiobooks. So there you go. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And audiobooks is a cheat code. Exactly. It right. is a cheat code. Yeah. So, and also many audiobooks come with like uh, companion PDFs. So mm. these days I'm listening to a lot of John Maxwell. He has great companion um, PDFs that summarize the chapters really well, in my opinion. Mm. And I, I even remember Craig Grosher's book, Winning the War in Your Mind. Um, even his book came with like a really, really good and well thought out uh, guide as well. So, mm. yeah. So, yes, it is a cheap book. Mm. So, by my rough estimation, in Trinidad and Tobago, the lockdown started around March. 2020 we are in may of 2022 which is 24 about 26 months yes so is it safe to say that it's 52 books in the last two years no it would not be safe to say that <laughs> because it, it didn't start as soon okay. as the lockdown started right um, okay i think i probably got into it either late 2020 or early 2021, right? Okay. So somewhere in there. And, and to be honest, it's a bit of a blur because, you know, with, lock, with the lockdown, everything yeah. just kind of, the, 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 it just kind of melted into each other. Yeah. So true. So true. Okay. So w- where would you put that number then in terms of um, the amount of books you would have read, let's say, in the last two years? Hmm. Somewhere between, I want to say, 
maybe around 30 ish. Okay. Uh, and that's I, still a great number. I, I think it's less than that, but kind of around it. Right. I'm thinking about my Kindle library. And right now it is well over 100 books for sure, right? Mm. Because of, of the pace of collection during the pandemic. But there are some books I would have focused on and read and read again, right? Mm. Revisited. And mm. there are some stuff I would have actually listened to and then listened to again, right? right. So, it's, so I haven't actually had time to go through my entire library. So mm. I think 30 is a safe number. Okay, okay. It's interesting, eh? Um, a business coach of mine, he always says this quote that you are the sum total of the books you read and the people that you associate with. Yeah. And a few minutes ago, you spoke about community and now you're talking about reading. And I'm seeing the books and the association in terms of who you are becoming and what you were able to achieve during these last um, 24 months or so. So really, really important, guys, to remember that you are the sum total of the books you read and the people you associate with. Or if you were to put it like how Andrew said it, the importance of community and being an avid reader. I want to add something to that, if I can. Mm -hmm. Sure. So something I was thinking about is, why are some people more successful than others? Or why, are some people, why is it that some folks stick a little bit longer to get there right, than others? And um, the thing that I thought about was what I would call inputs, right? Mm. Why does someone who is quote unquote privileged even seem privileged in the first place? We talk about, well, oh, they have money or they come from a good family or you know, when I look at other things. But objectively speaking, what I see is that these people have, might have access to better inputs mm. than other people, right? Mm. And so the folks that, that they surround themselves with and even the books you read, those things are, are inputs. Inputs, wow. You can, you can surround yourself with people who are noisy and who will tell you things that contradict the word of God or you can surround yourself with some good people who will encourage you to do good works. Mm. Right? And even when I think about uh, the books I read, why is it that I like Dave Ramsey? Why do I like John Maxwell or Henry Cloud? Because these guys are teaching me about stuff that really no one else did. Mm. And I won't say that it was anyone's intent to keep these things from me. I would just say that I did not have those inputs um, with, with my, within my immediate vicinity. So therefore, right. you know, I will go elsewhere and, and learn about leadership from someone or learn about um, managing money from Dave Ramsey, etc. Right? right? Learn about relationships from Henry Cloud, you know, learn from these guys. And the good thing about it is when you look at these things as inputs, right? The, the, the good thing about it is it's sort of empowering because you get to realize, well, you know what? For my life, I want the best possible inputs. Yeah. Let me take responsibility. Let me go after it. And that's actually why I'm such an avid reader. I, I take personal responsibility for how my life turns out. Wow. And, and I also really, really want to steward my life well. So therefore, yeah. I do everything in my power to make sure that, you know what? I'll be right inputs. And I'm also stewarding what I have well. Yeah. So, and, and you know, I guess inputs go, goes beyond just community and also your books, right? Inputs will be um, your diet. Inputs will be the music you listen to. Inputs will be the shows you watch, the conversations you have, um, even what you do to relax. Right? Um, I like the water. So, you know, the ocean. Well, I haven't been to the river in a while, but you know, those things are, are inputs. How do you reach out? Right? Mm -hmm. Talking to God, input. 
getting up early in the morning, um, listen to Christian music, worship and God, input. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. So, so imagine what, what life is like if you don't have those inputs. Right? Mm-hmm. Oh, so only things I, I kind of picked up during the pandemic was like um, taking care of plants. Right? So, <laughs> yeah, I remember I, I had a plant that I was told was an indoor plant. And I observed that it would always wilt, right? mm. like within a week. I'm like, wow, am I really doing such a bad job? And then one day, I thought, you know what? Let me see what happens if I leave this plant outside. What do you think happened? Thrive. Exactly, right? The right environment and the right inputs, it needed to be some right? mm. So of course, it, it isn't inside anymore, it's outside. Right. Right? Because now it's in the right environment and it's just surrounded by the, the right inputs. And, and the plant is so big now, it's hard to actually distinguish that one plant from everything else around it. Mm-hmm. Wow. There's so many leaves that I, I can barely see the actual pot. Right. right? That, that is in here. Right? So simply that, that shows to to be willing to filter the input because you received an input that that plant was an indoor plant. And you took it at face value at first and realized that there's something faulty about that input. And so you made the adjustment and you realized, hey, that input needed some changing, you know? Yeah. So, wow, powerful lesson there with that plant, man. Yeah. Powerful lesson. So Andrew, I think here is a good spot for us to go deeper. Remember, this is deeper than that. And I want to start off by reading a post on February 15th. Yesterday, I turned 33. And I am absolutely grateful to God for the wonderful journey that I've been on for the last 12 months. I learned a lot grew a lot, and changed a lot. This milestone is significant because at 33, I celebrate being debt-free. Let me read that part again. This milestone is significant because at 33, I celebrate being debt-free. It took a lot of discipline and sacrifice to get here but I made it. Let me fast forward. Being free, and he spelled it FR33, right? So that's free at 33 there. Becoming free has flung the doors of opportunity wide open. 2021 was awesome. How many people would say that? You know, some people canceling the whole of 2021 and saying they want to do over. Here's somebody saying that 2021 was awesome and 2022 will be even better. Hashtag debt free community, hashtag debt free journey, hashtag debt free, hashtag free. Ladies and gentlemen, the reason I wanted you all to hear from this young man is that at 33 years old, In the midst of a global pandemic and the midst of financial challenges, when people were losing jobs, they were losing income, and they were losing their minds, this man followed a path of financial stewardship that allowed him to become fully debt-free at 33 years old. Am I correct in saying that, sir? Yes, you are. Now, fully debt-free means you don't owe a credit union. You don't owe a bank loan. Nope. You don't own a car payment. Nope. You don't own any credit card debt. Uh-uh. You don't own any mortgage. Nothing. 100% of the money that you earn goes into your account and doesn't go to any creditor. Correct. How does that feel? Amazing, right? And 
I think the novelty of it is still here, right? Because imagine your salary comes and you're thinking, oh, all this is mine. And so mm. it, it, it really changes how you think. You know, normally when your salary comes, it's like, okay, I pay tithes. All right, who else I'll pay again? And then it just go to the whole yeah. list. All right, well, yeah. I own Sally for last month. You know, I, I, I cut my hair on credits. I need to go and pay the barber now. Oh, and then I bought 200 from my brother. I need to pay him back now. Yes. So instead of that, it's like, okay, well, now you have the resources. And, you know, you, you know freed up some space. So now you, now you have some options, you know? Right. And, and even when I think about, like, where we are now, I think it's like getting more expensive. It's mm. good to have the extra bandwidth and the extra room, mm. right? And I think it's important to talk about being debt free because, you know, if you don't think that being debt free is possible, what ends, ends up happening is that you start thinking of ways to get more money, like, oh, I need a promotion or I need to get a few side hustles. And increasing your income is always good. But I think. In some cases, or in most cases, a better way to increase your disposable income is simply to reduce your labels and your debt. Mm. So, yeah, it feels great. And um, like I said in the post, it, it really feels as if now you have what you need in your hand mm. to go and build something, you know? Mm. So uh, I guess I can talk about what the debt was. Um, so that debt, was, what was the total figure of that debt was? It was well over 100,000 for sure. Wow. I think it was even, I think it was, in all it was about 140,000, right? And change. Wow. Yeah. So that is a laptop, that is a car, and that is also two years of tuition for my master's degree. Mm. Yeah, I did a pretty expensive program. So, you know, that, that's what I was. School, mm. car, laptop. Mm. And, um, so, I, so my next question was going to be, pain brings purpose. So most times when people start on a journey like this, it's because of some pain point. So I guess for you, the pain point was that amount of debt, right? Well, not quite so. Okay. So I was actually pretty comfortable with the debt. Mm. Yeah. Which is a dangerous place to be. Yes. And I became comfortable because I thought, you know what? If I want more room in my budget every month, I can simply refinance push out the, uh, you know, submission, well, the deadline, I guess I'll call it that, and reduce the monthly payments, right? Mm. So I thought, you know what? Refinancing is an option. Let me do that instead. So I was actually very comfortable with it. The quote-unquote pain came when I wanted to buy a car. You know, I, I got a new job during the pandemic. I thought, man, you know, I'm making more now. Let me get an upgrade. Let me buy an mm. SUV, right? Mm. And thus saith the Lord, mm. do not buy a car this year. So, you know, the car was ready and everything. And I told those folks, hey, I'm sorry, but I, I can't go through this anymore. And mm. um, I was done. So I obeyed that instruction. And then God gave another, get out of this. Mm. And that is really what, you know, started everything. So it really wasn't a, a pain point, really. It was more like yes. God said obedience. something. Yeah, it, yeah, it's obedience, you know. Yeah. Uh, I obeyed the first instruction and, and then he gave another. So yeah. that's, re that's really where it started. So where did you discover the strategy to become debt-free at 33? Or what strategy, whose strategy did you follow? And how did you okay. find it? So... There is a, a little um, gentleman by the name of Dave Ramsey. I'm not sure if you've heard of him, but um, he I know is, him. 
and I hope that everybody else knows him. And if you don't know him, by the end of this podcast, Google him, YouTube him, do whatever you need to do to find him. Yeah, I, I came across Dave Ramsey listening to another channel on YouTube called Minority Mindset. He was talking about old books on finance and he made a statement. He said, anything from Dave Ramsey. So I'm like, if a, a Sikh, you know, an Indian, well, an Indian guy you know, of the Sikh religion is saying, listen to anything from Dave Ramsey, who's a Christian. Mm. Mm. Then what that tells me is, okay, then this Dave Ramsey guy has to be legit, right? right? So I actually looked, looked him up and I discovered the seven baby steps, which is like right. his path for, I would say, financial stability. Right. And the baby step in question is baby step two, which is to get you know out of debt, well, or non-mortgage debt. And he has a method called the debt snowball. Right. Now, so, I, I, go ahead. If, right. So just backtrack a bit, and can you just share... Um, really quickly, what those seven baby steps are for those who, for some reason, have not heard of Dave Ramsey or these baby steps before? Sure. The first is to build a starter emergency fund, which he says should be a thousand US dollars. Mm. Now, as a Trinidadian, I would say you want to save 10,000 TTD. Right? I, I think that's a, a good enough question to take care of things like car parts, maybe getting some new tires if need be, right? A little oil and filter here and there. I think 10 US dollars, sorry, 10,000 TT dollars should be enough to last for a while. Second baby step is to get out of all non-mortgage debt, which is what Ansel was talking about in my case, right? Your student loans, your car payments, um, any personal loans, Getting out of debt is baby step number two. Mm-hmm. Baby step number three, which is what I'm currently doing, is saving up six months of expenses. Well, his advice is actually three to six months. But because I'm single, I think a better question for me is to have six months of expenses saved up. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and that is your fully funded emergency fund. So once you get on with those three, there is a baby step called baby step 3B. That's where you actually save to get your house down payment, mm. right? Um, I, I think maybe step three and three B are some of the most interesting um, baby steps there are, but I'll get to that later. Next, there's baby step four, five, and six, which are kind of done simultaneously, right? Save the trans education puts away 15% of your income towards retirement and pay down your mortgage early, right? Four, five, and six happen simultaneously after the first three. And mm. step number seven is to live and give like no one else. Like no one else. Mm. Now that you have your house paid up for, the kids are off to school in college and they are doctors and lawyers and whatever God has for them. Well, what do you do with your wealth? Give. Right. right. So those are the baby steps. Right. And so at this stage, you have saved about 10,000 TT dollars, at least 10,000 TT dollars in your emergency fund. Right. And thank God we did not say where you are located. So nobody will come looking for you. And you have paid off all your consumer debt. So any student loans, any credit card payments, any car payments, anything outside of a mortgage payment is completely paid off. That's where you are at right now. Yeah. Yeah? Okay, good. Um, how long would you say it took you from the time you made the decision to follow these baby steps to actually complete in step two? 12 months. Exactly one year. And that's starting in the pandemic. Yeah, so I actually went to the bank in April of 2021, and I decided to increase the um, signing order on the loan, mm. right? 
And normally when you have a loan payment, it goes towards the interest first. But what I did was I created a standing order to go towards the principal, right? And that way it would actually reduce someone just being owed a lot faster, right? right. And so what, what I did over time was I calculated, you know, I had a budget and I was like, you know what, what can I adjust or, or cut back on so I can pay more every month? Right. So, you know, if you listen to Dave Ramsey or you read his books, you will talk about debt snowball, which is paying off your loans, smallest to largest, right? right? And of course, the reason for that is psychological. You gain momentum, you knock off one small loan, you yeah. think, you know what? I can do it again and again yeah. and again. Small in, my, in my case, I had one large consolidated loan. Mm. So my strategy was a little different. It was, I want to pay this thing off by the end of the year, right? And what I did over time was increased how much I was paying. So my standing order was two grand at first. Then it went to four, and then six, eight, and 10, mm. right? So with each month, I'm making another sacrifice, which is a sacrifice to cut back on something, mm. but also to give more and, and, and get rid of this debt. Mm. Yeah. yeah, okay. So, so not, there, not, not much it. There, there's a nasty B word that you use there just now. Some people, when they hear that word, they're like, ah, I don't want to do that. That is lockdown. That word called budget. <laughs> Get on a budget. And those guys who listen to Dave Ramsey, and again, I'm saying, find him, find him, find him. Um, I would say to use the supermarket approach when listening to Dave Ramsey, meaning, you know, when you go through the supermarket, you would not pick up every item on every shelf. You would take what you need and what you don't need, you will leave it there. And I'm saying that because sometimes his approach, sometimes his, um, his delivery of the message may not rub everyone the right way. But once you pick apart and you go past that and you go deeper, you will realize how sound the message really is. And almost every time that Dave Ramsey is giving someone advice, one of the first, first things he talks about is the budget. So for someone who is really considering being debt-free, someone who's really considering, you know, um, freeing up their income to build wealth and those things, Andrew, tell them why a budget as bad as it may sound, is one of the most important things to develop. Well, I'll explain how I used it and I'll tell you why. So the core of personal financial management is your behavior, right? Mm. That's really what it is. And a budget is simply a plan for how you're going to use your money. But for me, here's really what makes the budget so important. I'm going to have my budget at the start of the month. And then at the end of the month, I look at my bank statement. I will categorize my spending and then I will compare. Did I do what I said I was going to do this month? All right. A budget and then even that process of looking at the bank statement is a way of managing my own behavior and keeping myself accountable. Right? Because really, the objective is you want to stay on track with your goals. Right? Mm -hmm. the, budget, the budget says, here's my plan for managing my finances to hit my goals. But, but because you have this plan, you could then compare that against your behavior, mm -hmm. which is a bank statement. And, that, and again, you're going to find out, okay, where do you need to, to tighten up? What are some adjustments you can make? And let me give a very practical example here. I, the first time I did that, I made an observation. Every single time I went to the gas station, right, and I, I you know, had a habit of going at others, but every time I went there, I always spent more than what was required to fill my tank. 
Why? Because I'm getting snacks or, or drinks or something else. Mm. So I used mm. to change when I went to the gas station. So that way, there's less of a temptation. Mm. Right? And, I, I, and guess what? I think I saved about $500 just by making that small adjustment to my behavior. Wow. Wow. Right? Yeah. So, so a budget is simply a plan for how you're going to behave so that you, you meet your, your objectives and your goals. And it is an excellent measuring stick for your own behavior. Right. Wow. Yeah. Imagine saving $500 a month just in the gas station, guys. That definitely is an eye opener there. And I'm thinking, do I do that when I go to the gas station? I think, no, most times I don't. My thing is somewhere else. My, my behavior adjustment is in another area. Um, but yeah, powerful stuff there, man. Um, now, you spoke about uh, sacrificing and increasing the sacrifice, which helped to increase the payments so that you could pay off even faster. Um, what would you say was the hardest thing to give up on that journey? Hmm. All the things that I, I was getting into, I was getting out of that was investing. And, you know, I became quite eager to start investing. Hmm. And I'm thinking, yeah, man, you know, I can, I can get into this. And I saw some really good opportunities. Those opportunities turned out to be great opportunities. And I decided to stay focused and stay the course. So the hardest thing to give up was certain investment opportunities. And by, and by investment, I mean like stocks, right? And I'm, I'm talking about like things that quickly triple in value, right? Or quadruple in value. So having to pass on those things, I think was a big thing is like, you know, things that you can't put your money into, but yet I'm just being led, hey, steady course, stay focused. You know, don't don't move, don't flinch. Right. You know, yeah. So I think that's one. And I think I need to like just remind everyone of the context. Right? The COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdowns especially made my debt-free journey, I think, a little easier because I'm working from home. Mm. So I'm not using much in gas. I, you know, I'm not necessarily eating a whole bunch of meals outside, which we all know is expensive, right? I'm pretty much eating what I buy for groceries. Um, that's just about it, right? Mm. The, the pandemic made Managing my expenses a lot simpler, right? Mm. Because, because really I'm not moving about as much and I'm not spending as much either. Mm. So uh, I think that's really the um, most needed context. So in, in mm. my case, it was more about, you know, passing up on opportunities so I can stay focused. Right. Right. Yeah. So I think, I think now, I mean, things are open and, you know, people may have more access to those things that were not available during the pandemic. Um, but I guess we can uh, prescribe a quote-unquote pandemic mindset, meaning on your debt-free journey, limit the eating out, limit those other things that you probably did not have as much access to because you need to have what Dave Ramsey calls gazelle intensity you know um talk about that gazelle intensity in your 12 month journey andrew okay so there is a particular point in my journey when things became gazelle intense mm. so i'm checking away at this debt and this was my strategy right i would try to see how best I can knock off 10 grand every single month, right? Mm. 
Yeah, because you know, I, I ramped up from two to ten, mm-hmm. and I, I I tried my best to remain consistent with knocking off ten grand every month, right? So for me, a milestone was to move from like fifty to forty, or from forty to thirty, mm-hmm. and from you see from thirty to twenty, that was a huge one for me because if I got it under twenty, it means well, I'm almost there, right? I'm almost there. Mm-hmm. Now, for me, the momentum came when I made a hard decision. I had some money in an investment account. I decided, you know what? Everything except the minimum needed to keep the account open, I'm going to take mm. and put it on that debt. On the debt. Mm. So imagine having this money accumulating there, bringing in interest, and you say, you know what? I'm going to just put it on your debt. Mm. That was a hard decision, right? Can you give a ballpark figure as to what that, that was? Are you willing to? If you're not, you can decline. I decline. All right, no problem. So that should give you an idea of how big it was for him to decline saying, right? <laughs> uh, right. But we'll, we'll take it on face value that it was a hard decision. So, yeah, um, and that month, apart from that, you know, I, I would put myself in my salary and also around that time last year, I got some money from cut. I'm sure you did. Yeah, well. yeah, yeah. Right. Now, I looked at this thing and I'm like, yo, where did this come from? Yeah. Where did the money go? Into that. Oh. Exactly. Right. Right. And I think that to me is the hardest part of the journey at first. Right. To make a decision to say, you know what? I'm going to go through yet another month of not necessarily hardship, but discipline. Mm. Yeah, I deny myself certain things because I really want to get to this goal. Mm. Right. So I think, um, you know, that, that's, that's really when the, the momentum swung, when I put that investment money towards that debt, right. I said, you know what, you know. And I think that move got me somewhere around like 30 grand and change, right? right. Yeah, it, it got me below 40. And um, that is, is really what I'm thinking, okay, let me get to 30 you now. Let me get to 20. Let me get to 10. And then I'm pay it off. Mm. So, yeah. Wow. Good stuff. Good stuff. Guys, I really hope that y'all are getting some great value out of this. I definitely am. And just know that this is Andrew Olton. This is not some random guy from some faraway land. This is someone who is right here in Trinidad and Tobago. For those of y'all who may be listening and watching in other countries, this is a Caribbean boy that is talking about being debt-free at 33. Now, let's talk about that part in terms of Caribbean. Now, um, Dave Ramsey is American, and so his principles sort of suit um, some of the American financial instruments and and standards and practices. Um, Did you have to do any tweaking in his plan to fit uh, Trinidad or Caribbean lifestyle, one of which you spoke about um, that emergency fund in terms of it being 10,000 TT dollars. Are there any other tweaks that you would suggest or recommend to Dave Ramsey's plan for those in the Caribbean? Yeah. One of the things Dave Ramsey talks about is having no credit cards, right? And so I think in the Caribbean, this will always be something that we disagree with them on. Because for many of us in the Caribbean, your only way to really access foreign currency, especially if you don't get paid in foreign currency, mm. is a credit card. So if, let's say, you want to buy something on Amazon, that's probably going to be a credit card. One of the things I actually did in the pandemic was trade crypto. And I would have withdrawn the crypto, bought some Amazon gift cards, and bought some books that way. Mm. But uh, I mean, if it sounds complicated, 
It is, <laughs> right? So I don't recommend that to anyone. But I think the prior card is a, a, a modification I would, you know, encourage. I will say have a small limit, right? My limit is 400 US and I have no interest in increasing my limit simply because I, I don't shop online that often, right? And um, I don't really have need for like a, a huge credit card. So yeah, I like having a, a nice small credit card um, balance because again, it allows me to sort of carefully manage what is essentially a revolving loan. Mm. Right? So, and there is one more modification that I think is important. And that is the modification to baby step 3B. I think this baby step is the, the one that I think I can recommend to anyone. Right? So baby step 3B is where you save for a down payment on a house. Baby step 3B is where I've actually included the building of what I call sinking funds, all right? A sinking fund is pretty much like a fund, well, yeah, you can call it a fund that you have or an account that you create for savings for specific goals. So if let's say I want to travel to Dubai and that is like a bucket list item, mm. I will actually create a sinking fund for that. So you save for your house and there are some other things you want to do. And baby step 3B, before I get to like paying off the mortgage early and those things, baby step 3B is where I have a little fun. If let's say I always wanted to buy a unicycle, I'm gonna do that in baby step 3B. Yeah. yeah. Can you can you suggest a ratio then in terms of um what the division should be for the house and that sinking fund in 3B? Well, you're assuming that both things happen at the same time. It doesn't necessarily have to work that way. It can work in a sequence, mm. right? So if I know that taking a trip to London, for example, is going to take me just one month, then I'll do that first, right? Gotcha. Yeah, if I know saving for a house, it's going to take me two years, then, you know, that's kind of how I look at it. So I look at it more in terms of time based on the value I'm going for. Right. Yeah, and then, of course, you know, you can sequence things accordingly. Right. You don't want to take on too much at the same time because then it's going to slow your progress down. Yeah, right. right. Like, it's even for a house, but then there are like 10 other things in my bucket list I want to save for. Yeah. Right. And if let's say you are getting into a hobby like golf, you want to get some good clubs, and your clubs will cost you $20,000. Okay. I will ask you how long will they save? Or better yet, you want to get a new laptop. Okay. You've had a laptop for about eight years now. It's showing signs of age. Mm. Right. If you know you want to get something decent, I'll ask you how long will it save? Uh, of course, how long will it take you to save that uh, that amount of money for that laptop? Right? Mm. Yeah. I mean, and otherwise, if let's say you're married, you know, you're a young couple. Well, better yet, one person can continue to put towards the house, another person can save towards the other things. When that's done, get back on the house. Mm. So I guess this is a really good point to say, if you're married and you are doing this with your spouse, you want to make sure that your spouse is all in. Yeah. Because having a spouse that is not all in will be a very painful experience yeah. and it will make you feel very lonely. Mm. Right? I can't think of, you know, I mean, there are several things that can make you feel lonely in a marriage, but imagine working towards a goal the family mm. and your spouse says, no, I, I don't want to do that. I like what I'm doing right now. 
Mm. Right? So yeah, I think um, that's really, really important. So I would say, you know, if you want to get into investing or you want to get out of debt or make any major financial decision, speak with the spouse, right? Make sure you are pray about it, make God about it, and um, have a solid plan for moving forward, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah, it's going to be a little bit challenging if only one person sees the importance of doing something like this. Only one person makes sacrifices and then the other person simply does, you know, whatever they feel like, right? So, yeah. and again, you spoke about sequence and timing, right? If, what if there's a leak in the house while you're paying off debt? What do you do? What do you well, do? The answer is simple. Stop paying off debt and go fix the leak. Right. right? But then you might have a spouse who will say something like, man, you're so close. You're going to pay this off next month. Exactly. It could wait one more month. Stop mm. paying off debt, fix your house, and get back to that. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. So, so, yeah, I think that's um, really, really important. And also, you know, in that context, I would encourage anyone to be reasonable. And, um, you know, while it is good to be gazelle intense, you also want to be reasonable in the yeah. context of a, of a marriage as well. Yeah. Right? Uh, and um, understand what level of sacrifice is required from everyone. Right? Mm. Um, for, for one person, that might mean give half a salary. For another person, that might mean, well, make a different adjustment, but it might not be give half a salary, you know? Mm. Yeah. God might tell the husband that, and then the wife will be told something else like, well, you don't have to go out every weekend. It's, it's not the exact same instruction, but if that is God's requirement for your wife, so be it, right? Yeah. So, all right, nice, yeah. excellent advice there, man. Um, so just a couple of things I want to touch on before we close things out. Um, one of them is uh, how just describe that day, that time as best as you can when you paid that last payment. And you realize you now have zero debt. Just, just describe that for the person who wants to get there so that we can, you know, pre-play that victory. Okay. It was kind of bittersweet, and I'll tell you why. So it was a Friday. Um, after five, Sari came in. I thought, you know what? This is it. Last nine grand I changed to go. I'm, I'm going to finish it today. So I made the transfer and um, then I saw that the balance was zero, right? And it felt like, at first, a sigh of relief, like, and then there's also the euphoria, you know? One of the things that I, I did along the way to keep myself motivated was listen to death free screams by, you know, the, the Ramsey mm -hmm. show. Mm -hmm. You know, people are talking about all, you know, all that it did to get out of debt and, you know, the whole rice and beans, beans and rice thing. Yeah. And it felt like, whoo, wow, I, I finally got rid of this thing. And then it quickly started to feel weird. It's like, oh, I don't have any payments anymore. What? Mm. My salary is mine now? Mm. Wow. What do I do with, with all this money? And... Mm. Now, of course, you know, maybe step three is the answer, but it felt strange because, you know, you're making this sacrifice month after month yeah. and you have trained yourself to, yeah. learn, to, to, to live on very little. Mm. So now that that is no longer required, how do you shift from survivor mode into thriving mode now, mm. right? So it felt amazing and weird at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, because you spoke yeah. about that behavior modification. So you would have modified behavior to fit the sacrifice 
so much that it became second nature. And now you don't need to have that type of behavior anymore. So then there will be some undoing. Well, I would say so um, a little bit, but then I quickly got back into it because I, I realized that baby step three and three B is actually harder than baby step two. Let me explain okay. why. Okay, yeah, speak on it. With baby step two, you want to get this number down to zero. So your progress is super easy to measure, right? And with baby step three, it is as well, but it's like the goal, it's not goal, it's straightforward. I, I transfer this money to my loan, the number goes down, that's it, right? And I mm. can do it as soon as my salary comes in. Mm. Now, when you get to baby step three, the goal is different. The goal is, I want to save six months of expenses. Mm. How do I have this money here accumulating and piling up and not touching. Mm. That's the challenge. And so it requires even more self-control and even more discipline, right? Mm. The first discipline was render to Caesar that which is Caesar's. The second discipline is learn to steward what you have well. Mm. Don't just blow it. I mean, you know, the, the Bible says, in the house of the wise, mm. there are stores of meats and oils, but the fool consumes everything he has, right? So, so then the question is, okay, well, Lord, what is the wisdom for baby step three? What is the wisdom for this phase of my financial journey? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so you know, that's kind of where you have to learn things like paying yourself first, right? A salary comes in, what do you do? Immediately transfer the amount of money that you want to save into another account. Mm. That works, right? Um, even if let's say you have multiple streams of income, okay, don't have it all going into one account, mm. have separate ac- accounts, that mm. helps, all right? So yeah, paying, paying off that money felt great, but then, you know, I couldn't allow myself to get too uh, comfortable because I knew that, you know what? I'm not going up the hill. There's another level, right? And there are levels to this thing. And I will say this too. Going through this journey, maybe we'd appreciate those who have, right? You know, usually we think about uh, folks who have money as folks who may have inherited out of money or folks who would have gotten it from ill gotten gain or you know, folks were just lucky. But being on this journey made me realize that really a lot of stuff came through sacrifice over a period of time. Mm. Mm. Why? Yeah. How does one become a doctor? By, by making other sacrifices to study, work hard. You know, how does one climb the corporate ladder? Long, you know, late nights and other sacrifices, right? Mm. People get to where they are because at some point, a sacrifice was made, right? And I guess it is a simple thing like, if every single time you get $100,000, you spend it, you will never get a million, right? Mm, sure. If every single time, you, if let's say you get $100,000 um, and you, you save that amount 10 times, that's a million right there. But then you are making a choice to not blow that money. Right. Yes. Yeah, so, so really, you know, I always tell people that, that managing money is about managing yourself and having the character, right, to manage money, right? I, I, as a believer, I think managing finances is about stewardship, right? right, right? And it's about, you know, I have this money. Can I give an account to God and say, hey, God, I did a good job with this money. Yeah. Yeah. We all know about the parable of the talents. You had a guy who had one, a guy who had five, and a guy who had two. Those who were given more stewarded what God gave them in the first place well. Right? 
You want to get a promotion? You want a larger income? Steward what you have right now really, really well. Mm. Show God that you can manage ten thousand dollars before he, you, you give it. He gives you twenty, right? Mm. Show God that you can manage twenty before He gives you fifty. Show Him that you can manage fifty before He gives you one hundred, right? And, and and you know, really, if you think about it like that, I I want to get better with my money because I want to steward what I have really, really well. Then I, I think that creates a, a safe platform to actually you know handling your finances as a believer. Right? Versus something like, well, I work so I can pay tithes. True. Well, actually, no, that's not true. That's not true at all. <laughs> right? I used to believe that. Right? You know, tithes for me is an expression of gratitude. And so my thing is, hey, God, thank you for everything I have. Yeah. Tithes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So th- that kind of um, leads into the next question I was going to ask. Um, you are a believer, but you are one that's actively working on building wealth. And sometimes they are seen as two separate things. And sometimes, you know, believers are thought to be backsliding or getting worldly when they talk about building wealth, developing wealth, being rich. Um, why was it important for you to have the two work together as opposed to seeing them as two separate things? On one hand, being a Christian, and on the other hand, building wealth. Why was it important to, for you to be a wealthy Christian? I think for me, it was more about the journey than the um, destination. And the reason for that is because, well, when I started getting into investing, God said, don't know how to invest, right? Mm. So the first instruction was, don't buy that car. The second instruction was, get out of debt. And then the next instruction was, don't know how to invest. And in learning how to manage money and following biblical financial principles, you know, that sort of created a, a platform for me to actually engage with God. Like, I asked God, like, why am I even doing this if... According to the, the parables, you know, with the, the sower and the seed, you have folks who, who see it as being choked by the deceitfulness of riches. Mm. That is what convicted me. And I'm like, well, if the deceitfulness of riches is a, a problem, why am I even doing this? Right? Mm. So, of course, I, I went even deeper. Now, going back to that parable of the talents, I read it again, but I looked at it from a, a different perspective. Instead of being the servant who is given talents, I looked at it from the perspective of the master who has talents to give. Mm. So in other words, you are the master, or rather you are looking at the master and, and trying to understand how he does things. But that right there became for me the core of biblical finance, which is you are learning how God does things and therefore, in properly pursuing the book of finance, you are supposed to be becoming more like God, right? Mm. So, for example, in that parable, Matthew 25, the parable of, of the talents, it says that the master gave everyone talents according to their ability. Mm. That means he actually would have understood what each one was capable of, and there would have been some sort of assessment at some point. So, of course, that tells me before I invest in anything, make sure I understand. But what's really happening is I'm looking at the master and I'm adopting his ways, right? Hmm. Going even deeper into that, I quickly discovered that God has an opinion on what wealth actually is, right? Uh, Revelation 3 says, come buy from me gold so that you'll be rich. What? God says, come buy from me gold? What is he talking about? God says, store your treasures, treasures in heaven. Right? What does that mean? Uh, and so my thing is, uh, and God is really, really smart. Even though my initial intent for going into the Bible was, I want to get better with money, God's thinking is, yes, come. Come and learn about wealth. 
but come and learn about my view of her. Mm. So really, managing money, to me, is just, I think a platform that God used to adjust certain things in my character. But the, the good thing is, I went deep enough to understand that what he's after is that my focus is on eternal things. Mm. Right? If God says, solve a church in heaven, you find my thinking will always be about, okay, with my behavior, my decisions, am I doing that? All right? Mm. If, God, if God says, come buy from me gold, what does that mean? That means, hey, pay the price for your personal process. Is Christ being formed in me? That has eternal value. Mm. Right? And so if anyone asks me, hey, Andrew, what does it mean for a believer to build well? I will say to pursue those things that have eternal value. Even in your stewardship of finances, what are you doing? You are, you are creating the means to take care of your, of your family, um, see about folks in church, or, or just do whatever God has called you to do. Mm. Right? And so wealth is simply a, a, a means and end. Because, I mean, this earth is fading, right? So, right. you know, the, the, the emphasis isn't only money. It's about what are those things that we are going to do that have eternal value? Mm. That's the emphasis. That is, is really what wealth is. Right? Mm. You know, in the Bible, you know, we read about burnt works, right? It makes no sense piling up a whole bunch of money, breaking on bands to build bigger ones. Then your life is demanded of you, and the only thing you can say is, hey, God, I build bigger bands. Mm. <laughs> I mean, it even sounds silly. Mm. Right? This is saying, you know, you come before God fully confident, and you aren't surprised that you are there. Mm-hmm. You, you, you meet God at the end of time and you, know, you say, I'm, I'm here, I'm home. Mm-hmm. After a long journey, God, I'm here. Right? It's like, that is where you want to be. That is well. Mm-hmm. Yeah? That is value. Mm-hmm. So basically you're saying that the pursuit of wealth is not just to amass as much as you can but to ensure that it further proves the eternal plan or the eternal goal that God has set out for you. So wealth creation, wealth development, wealth pursuit should be within the context of wanting to ensure that I make my heavenly father proud. Exactly. That's it, right? Because... You know, we all know that we are accountable for our choices. Mm. That also includes your choices with money. Mm. Right? So, for example, if you are broke because, well, you took your rent money and you went and gambled and you lost it, that actually isn't good stewardship. That's bad stewardship. Mm. Right? If, let's say, you took some extra money and you saved and then when the day came when your son needed some new shoes, you were able to buy it, good on you. That's good stewardship. Mm. Right? Because you, you, you did, you, uh, you made the right choice that allowed you to provide for your family. Mm. Yeah, so, yep, exactly. All right. Um, well, to close this off and to put a bow on it, Andrew, I want you to talk to someone who after hearing the fact that you were able to do it and accomplish it, um, building wealth, getting debt free at 33 years old and having all of this um, funds, this money available to you to do whatever God is calling you to do. Um, Someone who says, after listening to this, all right, I'm going to get things started. I'm going to, you know, get on my debt free journey what would you say is something they should look forward to or look out for? And what would you say they should avoid as they move through that journey based on your experience? All right. So I, I think I, I can kill two birds with one stone here. Mm. And I'm actually going to touch on the thing that you mentioned at the beginning of this yes. podcast, which yes. is community. So yes. in a conversation that I had with Ansel, I made the statement that wealth is built in community, mm. which is not a statement I will take credit for. It's actually a statement that was made by Mr. David Rose, 
all the way in Jamaica in a Telegram group for Learn, Grow, Invest, right? That is the community that I got connected to during the pandemic, and they taught me a lot, right? They have a, a buzzing and active Telegram group. They are also on YouTube, and you know, even tonight there was a, a video um, talking about learnings and so on. And so, simply being around folks who are on the same path, you find that it's gonna catalyze your own growth and your own learning. And also, it's also really, really good to have folks turn you on as you hit milestone after milestone, right? Like, like I remember getting down to like 17 grand in there, right? And I was able to say, hey guys, man, I'm so close, I could taste it, right? And, and you know, it's like, I'm saying like, I'm two months away from, from paying off this thing. And then you were like, yeah, man, go for it, go for it. And then when I paid it off, it was so good to have folks celebrating with me. So I would say, you know, if you're doing this, find a community, get plugged in, learn, go invest. You know, we're on Facebook, Telegram, Instagram. Um, we're everywhere, right? I would say, get plugged in, get connected. And don't, this isn't necessarily something that you want to do on your own. I think it, it gets a lot harder if you do this on your own. So, uh, so there is another thing I want to point out about community. It's really important that you not do this alone because there are many scams out there. And, you know, we all would have heard about the Susu, aka the blessing room, <laughs> aka bring two people and come, <laughs> aka my followers still do so many and all that stuff. <laughs> and, you know, I think people were really, really hurt by these things, and you have to understand how they work. They work simply because someone trusts someone to point them in the right direction to make a good investment. Mm. The sad thing about it is people aren't always savvy and don't always have an eye to spot these scams. And so again, communities also a place of, of protection, right? Someone can look at um, the blessing room, think about the maths and say, hey, something that's right here, I don't think you should do this, right? So encouragement and support, that is something you're gonna get in community, but also protection from scams and things that will hurt you. That is another thing that you get from community. So I, I will say, if I can give credit to anything, it is, the beautiful people at Learn Green Best. So shout out to Jermaine and Renee McDonald. I love you so much in Christ. And I really appreciate you too. And um, you know, they, they really helped me to stay on course. Also, I think Chike Fairway is, is another book room like myself, but me some great resources and everyone in the community. Right? So I, I will say for sure, you know, uh, community is something to look out for. Right? Mm. And also, you really want to find the right people. You know, um, Ansel and I were talking about inputs, you know, that fuel and, and catalyze your growth, right? The yeah. books you read, the people that you surround yourself with, with this journey, I think the same thing is applicable. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Nice. And I, I want to shout out the BWW family. Um, that has been the community that I've been learning from in terms of personal development asset development and those kinds of things. Um, so yes, I also would endorse uh, having community. And I just want to take a moment to say thank you to Andrew as well, um, because Andrew has been checking in with me since he found out that I've been on the journey. He's been checking in every now and again, asking how is it going? And I've had some setbacks, I'll be honest. Um, some of these steps take a little longer than others depending on what stage of life you're at. Um, but he's always encouraged and he said, you know, it's worth it. Keep going, dust yourself off, go again. And um, I appreciate you for that so much, Andrew. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, we did get really deep when it comes to personal finances, when it comes to the mindset of wealth management and finding out why you should pursue it. And we heard live and direct from a young man who was able 
in the midst of financial challenges globally, in the midst of a pandemic, to pay off over $100,000 in debt legally. I want to put in that part, right? And so there are certain principles, there are certain uh, disciplines, behavior modifications that are important for us to apply to get to that level. Andrew, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your wisdom. I pray God's continued success be upon you as you develop wealth thank you very much. for his kingdom. And I look forward to seeing and hearing you at step four, step five, step six, and even step seven. Yeah? So, so, so same yeah, man. Any closing remarks before we, we close out? Yeah. Um, the one thing I'm thinking about is that God was the one who really helped me along the way, right? Mm. Like, we're talking about me doing this in the midst of a pandemic. And, you know, the instruction was get out of that. And so when I look back at everything that happened, really, God was the, the one who I would say helped me to continue doing that in the midst of the uncertainty, mm. right? Because, I mean, and it is sort of counterintuitive to pay up that while you know, in a pandemic, right? right? right. You know, I guess the logical thing to do would be, well, hey, save. Hold as much as you can. I hold as much as you can. Don't spend mm-hmm. anything, right? But really, because my instruction was get out of debt, my faith was, you know, hey, what is going to provide the means mm-hmm. as I do this, and he's going to take care of everything, right? right. And I, I remember there was one time I had some stuff to do with my car, and that is when that extra money from cut came in handy, mm. right? Yeah. Mm. You understand? So, so it's like, I had this stuff to do with my car, I had to spend this money, but then I got this other money and it kept me going. Mm-hmm. And I was able to maintain the momentum, right? So I think really God was the one with me every step of the way. And if you feel led by God to do this, then you, know, you can rest assured that God will help you take care of everything and his financial goals, right? So, you know, I have to say, glory to God for that. You know, this would not be possible without him at all. You know, you have um, smart ways of budgeting and making decisions and all that. But, but really, um, I think the, 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 the fuel behind everything was just that, that unction from God pushing me, you know? Mm. Yeah, so... That's the last thing I'll say. Go with God. Go with God. And with God, all things are possible. Amen. So that's it for this episode of Deeper Than That. I definitely got more than my money's worth. Thank God I didn't have to pay for this one. But again, thank you so much to Andrew. And ladies and gentlemen, I hope that you found something from this conversation to help you to be great and to do great and remember as you continue living your life go deep because you never know what you'll find it this is ansel signing off